Today we're going to talk about aseptic meningitis, which is a very common clinical syndrome. You will see this wherever you practice in the world. This particular clinical syndrome also teaches us to be comfortable with uncertainty because there are so many different causes of aseptic meningitis. So we're going to be focusing on the clinical syndrome, primarily the epidemiology, as well as the diagnosis. Here are the learning objectives for this video to develop a working differential diagnosis for aseptic meningitis and outline a diagnostic approach to aseptic meningitis. I'd like to go over a couple of definitions. Aseptic meningitis is when you have inflammation of the meninges, which are shown in this cartoon here. And when we send the CSF for culture, for bacteria, nothing grows. This is in contrast to bacterial meningitis in which we do the same test, but we do isolate a bacteria. Encephalitis occurs when you have uh, inflammation of the brain parenchyma, and meningoencephalitis occurs when you have both inflammation of the brain parenchyma as well as the meninges. So as I said, aseptic meningitis and encephalitis is a very common syndrome. It's estimated between 10 and 15 million cases occur in the United States. Also, it occurs throughout the year, but different causes will cause peaks in incidence in different types of the year. So you can see that in this slide here, um, where more cases occurred in May through September, and this is very typical of enteroviral meningitis. So when a patient comes in uh, with aseptic meningitis, you cannot distinguish them for someone who has bacterial meningitis. Um, they have fever, they have other symptoms related to the primary illness like diarrhea or cough or runny nose. They have neurologic symptoms, headache, which is often diffuse, sleepiness, confusion. They may have focal neurologic symptoms such as tingling, numbness, or weakness in their arm or leg. They may present initially with seizures, especially if they have encephalitis. Because there's so many different causes of aseptic meningitis, a careful history about exposures is really important. You need to ask whether they've had any insect bites, have they been around animals, have they traveled anywhere, been camping, or exposed to contaminated water, and find out exactly what kinds of medicines they're on. So there are additional factors that can influence how a patient presents to your uh, care. So depending on the etiology, you're going to get different presentations. If you have local inflammation of the brain parenchyma, say like you have with, with herpes simplex virus type 1, you may present with focal seizures like temporal lobe seizures. If you have inflammation along the base of the brain like we see with mycobacterium tuberculosis, you may present with hydrocephalus and slowly declining uh, mental status and present as a coma. The age of the patient matters. Young patients often present with nonspecific symptoms, only fever and lethargy. Adults present with more classic presentations as I outlined above. An impaired immune uh, status is going to change the way the patient comes in um, to your office. They may have lower fever, mild symptoms, or may have overwhelming infection if they are severely immunocompromised. When we do the physical exam, we're really focusing on uh, looking for evidence of meningeal irritation. So you can see in the cartoon when we um, extend the leg at the knee or flex the neck, um, we stretch the meninges and cause pain. And so those are the Koenigs and Brzezinski sign, which we do to look for meningitis. You're doing the same thing if you ask the patient to touch their chin to their chest, again, stretching the meninges. We look for focal neurologic signs to go along with the symptoms. Um, mental status is important. And then we'll do a complete physical exam looking for other clues such as rashes. So no matter what the cause of meningitis, the evaluation is always the same. We are going to do a CSF evaluation uh, through a lumbar puncture. We'll measure opening pressure, glucose, protein, and then we'll send cultures for bacteria as well as gram stains. We always save another tube of CSF in case bacteria do not grow, and then we have to figure out what to do um, because the patient has aseptic meningitis. So here's how I think about uh, the diagnostic approach. So you have a patient who comes in with uh, aseptic meningitis, you do the lumbar puncture, and you find that they have no white blood cells. At that point, you need to consider alternative diagnoses. If you do the lumbar puncture and you find they have increased white blood cells in the CSF, then you're looking for bacterial growth and you find out that they have bacterial meningitis. If nothing grows, you know that then they have aseptic meningitis. So how to think about aseptic meningitis? So I'd like to point out from the very beginning 
that there are non-infectious causes of aseptic meningitis, and we're going to come back to those. But when I think about infections and aseptic meningitis, I think of five broad categories. First of all, bacteria that won't grow on the standard media can cause aseptic meningitis, like mycobacterium tuberculosis. If the patient received antibiotics before the lumbar puncture, that can sterilize your cultures and make it look like you have aseptic meningitis. Viruses are the most common cause of aseptic meningitis, and fungi and parasites uh, do cause aseptic meningitis, usually in immunocompromised hosts. So I'd like to go through a few of the CSF profiles to highlight some differences between those different um, etiologies. So remember that bacterial meningitis has positive cultures and gram stains. They have, uh, patients have low glucose in the CSF due to increased utilization by white blood cells and bacteria. The protein is high and the white blood cell count is elevated with a predominance of neutrophils. In contrast, because aseptic meningitis is caused by so many different things, you can have variable glucose, variable protein, and elevated white blood cell count, but it can be highly variable from just a little bit elevated to um, very high. Again, the gram stain and bacterial cultures are negative. Pretreated uh, bacterial meningitis is going to look very similar to bacterial meningitis with low glucose, high protein, and elevated white blood cell count, but your cultures are negative. This is in contrast to viral meningitis, which has a normal glucose, normal or slightly elevated protein, and then elevated white blood cell counts with a predominance of neutrophils early and lymphocytes predominating later. I'd like to turn to those non-infectious causes of aseptic meningitis. So this patient comes in and she's 14 years old and she's had about a week of worsening headache um, and she began to have a stiff neck and fever. You can see by her rash that she has systemic lupus uh, erythematosus and the vasculitis in her brain is causing the aseptic meningitis. This is an MRI of a 20-year-old woman who presented with progressive left hemiparesis after having a cold a week earlier. Um, you can see that she has these asymmetric le uh, lesions on her MRI, and she was treated with steroids and rapidly improved. She has acute inflammation and demyelinization of the white matter, and she has acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, a common cause of um, uh, aseptic meningitis and encephalitis. Finally, don't forget to ask that history about the kinds of medications that patients are taking. Um, sometimes uh, medications such as ibuprofen, um, a few antibiotics, and immunomodulators can actually cause aseptic meningitis. So what do you do if you have a patient who has aseptic meningitis? You need to revisit the history and physical and ask more questions and make sure your physical exam was actually accurate and thorough. Then, thinking about the five, the five different categories that we talked about, you're probably going to need to send special CSF cultures, like cultures for mycobacterium or stains or antibody tests, looking for those bacteria that don't usually grow on routine cultures. Molecular testing is very important for viral um, infections. PCR on the CSF for viruses is very standard to isolate the common causes of viral meningitis or encephalitis. Cultures from other sites might identify the organism. And finally, remembering those non-infectious causes, you may need to do additional tests such as imaging and rheumatologic tests uh, to find out if those are causing aseptic meningitis. So in summary, um, aseptic meningitis is a very common uh, clinical syndrome. A detailed history and physical is critical. The initial diagnostic test is evaluation of the CSF. And the most common causes are viral meningitis, pretreated bacterial infections, and infections by organisms that are not usually detected on routine culture.